Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar. This is Tom Banke with Forward Community Investments, and we're excited to have you join us for today's presentation. Before we get going, I'd like to take this opportunity to share the background of how we got here today. Forward Community Investments has worked with Wisconsin nonprofits for almost 20 years. We build capacity in nonprofits through low-cost loans and expert advisory services. As the most established financial management advisor of its kind in Wisconsin, Forward Community Investments provides its clients with guidance, resources, skills, and capacity building as a means of building strong, secure, and sustainable communities one nonprofit at a time. Wisconsin nonprofits are faced with many complex problems today. Based on Forward Community Investments 2012 survey of the nonprofit sector across Wisconsin, 58% reported expenses increasing, while only 37% reported revenue increases. It's a fragile financial cycle that has been challenging for most, which is why fund development success has become so critical. While the good news is that with the support of BMO Harris Bank, Forward Community Investments is offering a series of webinars to augment the building financial sustainability, a virtual leadership series, and to further build nonprofit effectiveness. A year ago, Harris and M&I came together to form BMO Harris Bank, a strong U.S. bank that offers more for the customers and communities it serves. BMO Harris Bank is an active partner in Wisconsin communities and demonstrates strong corporate citizenship as an important part of whom they are and how they approach the community. We thank BMO Harris for their support to, build, uh, to provide Building Financial Sustainability, a virtual leadership series for Wisconsin's nonprofit community. Right now I'd like to go through some housekeeping notes. You can join the webinar using the telephone number provided in your confirmation email that was sent to you from GoToWebinar, or you can use your computer speakers, which is recommended by GoToWebinar. We want to make this webinar as interactive as possible, and we'll be taking questions during the webinar. You can, you can submit these questions using the chat or questions box that are located on the right-hand side of your screen. Right now, we'd like you, everyone, to participate in the first poll of the webinar. Please answer this first poll that is appearing on your screen now, asking what is your role in your organization. Okay, we're seeing some answers come through. We've got about 40% of executive directors, uh, quite another 40% of staff. So thank you to everyone who has uh, participated in that. Now we would like you to use the chat function of the GoToWebinar. Using that feature that's located on the right hand side of your screen, please enter your name and your organization. Well, thank you everyone for being interactive in today's webinar. We encourage you to participate throughout the webinar. Now that we have those tasks out of the way, let's get to know our speaker. Uh, today's topic is fundraising presented by Dave Sternberg is a partner for Loring and Sternberg Associates. Dave Sternberg has been a fundraising professional since obtaining his BA degree from The Ohio State University. He is a member of the faculty at the Center of Philanthropy at Indiana's University's Fundraising School and a governance consultant for BoardSource. He is the only person in America to hold that position with both organizations. For the Fundraising School, Dave teaches developing annual sustainability, principles and techniques of fundraising, developing major gifts, as well as numerous customized trainings, programs nationally and internationally. In 2006, he authored the, the course Purposeful Boards, Powerful Fundraising in Partnership with BoardSource. In 1996, Dave founded Loring Sternberg & Associates, providing fundraising counsel to educational foundations, social services organizations, higher education, 
membership organizations, children's groups, and museums. Right at this time, we'd like to turn it over to Dave uh, for today's webinar. Thank you, uh, Tom. I can assure you that of all the introductions I've had, that one was the most recent. Um, today we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, well, we're going to talk a lot about fundraising, but um, one of the I want us to keep in mind today, as the title implies, is it's really probably not about the economy. So as we go through today, I think a little bit about, um, you know, the reasons we think we might be struggling with fundraising against why we might be struggling with fundraising. So. Let me talk a little bit about the agenda that we're going to accomplish today. One is uh, we're going to take a look at the data uh, in our in, in the sector, and that data will um, tell us some things that we think are important in terms of what's actually happening uh, out in our fundraising world, um, and then um, what might not be happening. The other is a little bit about the strategy of fundraising itself, and do we really understand that uh, and what it means. Um, the other thing is to look at creating a, a fundraising program that has the right emphasis. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about, you know, specifically what does that mean. Right now we all work in a, non, you know, a nonprofit where the emphasis is we need more money. And, and, and that's a, a very simplified version and probably a problematic approach. The other is to look at responsibilities of board members in fundraising. Most of us don't have a fundraising shop that has 100 or 200 people in it. So how we form that team becomes important. And then one of the other things um, that impact our organization that make fundraising more challenging when actually it's not about fundraising itself. So that, that sort of gives you an idea of the territory we're going to cover today. And let me share as a backdrop some other sort of theoretical things I think you want to keep in mind. Um, one is, as you already know, nonprofit organizations are certainly not entitled to support. They, in fact, must earn that support. Um, there isn't a magic bullet to fundraising. So a successful fundraising uh, is, is not a magic formula. Um, it's as much art as it is science. And fundraising is not only raising money. Um, it is, in fact, uh, a process where if we do it correctly, we're going to raise friends along the way. Um, remember, and I've seen this, and, it, and it, uh, it's irritating to me when I hear it, but you don't raise money by begging for it. We are helping people who have um, a challenge. Uh, we have a mission, uh, and, and they all vary. But we're trying to make the world a better place for somebody else, or through some program, or through some service. And you know, it's a great opportunity for us to be able to do that. We're not begging for anything. We're trying to give people the opportunity to help others. Uh, people, <clears throat> they won't give money if they're not asked which is not a shorthanded version of saying, no, just run out and ask people for money. There's certainly more to it than that. But the number one reason people don't give is they're not asked. Now, this is as much for board members as it is for anyone else. But you don't decide today to raise money and then ask for it tomorrow. This, is a, this isn't a sprint. You know, it's a marathon in terms of the process and understanding and implementing it correctly. And you know, maybe the easiest way that we communicate with board members is, of course, you know, your donors are customers. And so to the extent that their money makes things happen, we need to think about them in terms of their, their being customers. What is the customer's wants and needs? Now, when we look at the fundraising landscape, so you can go ahead and put that forward. Thank you. If you look at the fund, you can go back one, I'm sorry. If you look at the fundraising landscape, the total amount of money given to charity last year was $316 billion, with a B. Um, and this is important because oftentimes I stand with a client and I'm, I'm, I'm working with their board and, and they think, well, money is limited. And, well, money is limited, but oftentimes they don't realize the vast amount of money that actually goes to charity. And so it's usually quite more than they believe. And 316 is an impressive number of note. When you look at total giving by gross dollars, 2009 was largely the only year it declined. And so the U.S. has been through many recessions, wars, you know, terrible terrorist attacks, things have happened, and philanthropy has grown essentially every year but one. This is a growing business. The, the belief is it is not. The data says otherwise. And when we look at the $316 billion, we see that 85% of it comes from individuals, 10% from foundations, and 5% from corporate America. And I share this because 
if I ask a board typically what's the breakdown, they often have yeah. that turned around. Well, the vast majority of the money comes from foundations and corporations, not individuals. And when they learn it's individuals, what they discover is in order to be okay. successful at raising money, we need to know the marketplace. There's more money than we think. And the, and the source of that money is different than what we believe it is. So if we're going to be successful in any of this, we need to know what the marketplace tells us. The other thing that's interesting to me, if you continue to look at the landscape, is um, if you go to the next slide, you'll see that individuals essentially gave $260 billion last year. And that's the, you know, roughly, for those accountants out there, you can correct me, but that's, you know, the 85% of the total. Now. What's interesting is uh, the Center for Wealth Management at Boston College says, well, how did we give that money? So they looked into how do we give the money. And the way we gave the money, 85% of the contributions we gave were in the form of cash, so a check, a credit card, cash. And 15% were in the form of assets. And I look at that statistic and I scratch my head and I wonder, what is wrong with that statistic? Now, you may be thinking, well, cash is king. So, Dave, there's nothing wrong with that statistic, except we as Americans are asset rich. We have more in our assets than our cash. In fact, many of the things I've read suggest that if we all did a financial inventory on our own, what we would find is we're 85% assets and 15% cash. So here we have a sector that's running around asking for money and getting cash, which is the smallest amount of resources we as individuals have. So Boston College went a step further and said, if we cashed out every American age 55 plus, what is the real cash value? And the answer is $36 trillion. There's $36 trillion combined asset value of everyone in the United States who is 55 years and older. And you know, they did some jockeying around. They looked at that and said, what is the average age at which you know, we're unencumbered by our debt? Uh, mortgage paid, peak income, retirement account at its max. That's where the 55 years old came from. But that group alone controls $36 trillion, and we're only raising $316 billion. I think the data, when you actually take a look at it, um, says something remarkable in terms of this is not an environment of scarcity at all. This is a ripe environment where there's plenty of people who want to do something important with their resources, and we have just a great idea for them. But, but we have to leave the conventional thinking that money is limited. Yes, there's a limit. We're just not anywhere near that limit yet. So the other question I often ask is, do you understand what it means to fundraise? And basically, at the simplest level, we're talking about cultivation, solicitation, and stewardship. So, so what does that mean? Well, cultivation is the process by which we're building relationships with people. Solicitation, of course, asking for money. And stewardship would be um, the point at which we're building a relationship uh, after a gift has been made, and we're spending the money in the way that we said we would. So these are the components of fundraising. And I often ask, and, and per our poll, I'll ask you, of the three components, cultivation, solicitation, and stewardship, which do you spend most of your time doing in your organization of those three? Which one gets most of your time and attention? I hope when we're, we're done making a choice here that we see that collectively what you guys uh, answered is, is amongst the more common answer that we get. <clears throat> And Tom will share the results of our poll. Hey, Dave, it's Dennis, actually. And it looks like about almost 80% of the folks on the line, which we have close to 100 people on the line today, have, have responded. And it was 33% cultivation, 40% mm -hmm. solicitation, and 28% stewardship. So there's okay. still coming in, but definitely All it right. looks like the majority of are saying solicitation. Well, and lo and behold, if we look at the next slide, the most common answer is, thank you, Dennis, the most common answer for us is solicitation. So most of us spend most of our time going out and asking people for money uh, rather than using a 
to find way in which we build a relationship first and then ask for money and then steward that relationship. And here's the analogy I make. Now, how many of you, if you forward to the next slide, how many of you remember being in the eighth grade? Okay, so think about the eighth grade dance that you attended. Now, if you're like me, uh, you went to the eighth grade dance, and when you arrived at the dance, what you saw in the room were boys on one side and girls on the other. Now, I know, you know we saw decorations and the streamers and punch, but most importantly is there were boys on one side and girls on the other. And the truth of the matter is, is when we answer solicitation, what we're doing is we're walking right into that dance, we're yanking someone's wrist, and we're pulling them out onto the dance floor. It's clunky. It's probably not going to get a second dance. You know, it just, it's this. We need to quit doing this herky-jerky, uh, go for the gusto, ask for money before we have a relationship with folks, versus walking up to somebody, telling them that they're, outer blue tuxedo looks great, their pink taffeta dress is lovely, because this is what we want. We want to have this kind of interaction with people, but we do it in terms of a helter-skelter approach at an eighth grade dance. We, we need to stop doing that. We think that this is 90% cultivation and stewardship and 10% soliciting. Soliciting is easy to do. So when we look at cultivation, we need to think about things like uh, building relationships with our prospect. How are we doing that? Are we bringing them on site? Um, are you as a board member letting people know that you're involved in an organization? Are we uh, communicating with people directly uh, in print or you know social media? Or uh, um, are we generating interest? So how are we working our public? And I guess for public, because that can mean so many different things. Of which member of and how does my Hey Dave, you're breaking in and out. I don't. I think we're getting okay. some feedback here. Sorry to interrupt you. Okay, that's fine. Is this better? Yeah, that is better. Okay. So, you know, how are we working with our public? So, are we showing folks what the organization is all about? Sort of where our history has been, what our programs are, impact, what our goals for the organizations are. And, and that varies depending on who the public is you're talking about, what that message would be, of course. But are we, in fact, at the end of the day, friend raising? Are we, are we friend raising? And so I think to myself, you know, when you go out and, and see a, a good movie, you know, <clears throat> what, what do you do when you see a great movie, right? Most of us um, are probably going to say, well, um, we run out and we tell everybody. You know, in fact, I, I don't just tell everybody. I'm, I'm tweeting. I'm Facebooking. I'm, um, you know, renting an airplane to skywrite how awesome the movie was I saw. And the truth of the matter is, if you took that same body of people that you were telling how awesome that movie is, the question I always pose is, are you telling those people you're involved with your organization, or if you're a board member, are you telling them you serve on this board? Because my opinion is, you know, Hollywood probably doesn't need more money. I'm just I'm going out on a limb there. But your organization does. And so, um, you know, it needs to be top of mind. It needs to be, uh, um, you know, promoted in a way that people are thinking about it. Now, when you get to the process of solicitation, you know, yes, we're asking for financial support. And so how do our organizations do that? Well, we can certainly... Um, ask people in person, which we know is the most successful way. But of course, we can only get to so many people. So we're sending things in the mail. Is that a direct mail letter? Is that a newsletter? Uh, we're calling people on the phone. I know that gives a lot of you the heebie-jeebies. We're hosting benefits or other special events. We're using the internet. Um, this is basically we're engaging people in the various ways that we engage, supporting a way that we can money. In fact, stewardship, cultivate solicitation and stewardship, you know, why are we soliciting? Well, it's easy because most of the ways we ask for money is impersonal. It, the reality is we just expect the kind of results you're going to get when you're, when you're in someone's living room asking them for money. So I think we have to understand 
what are our expectations given the strategies we want to use? And they all come, you know, with a different set of expectations. Globally, it's the program, but we want to make sure that we understand, in fact, what those expectations ought to be. So uh, solicitation, I think, is easy. Half of it, we don't talk to anybody. You know, a small portion of it, we might. And so we can do it on a mass scale, and we do it, and we're missing some other components, as I noted, the cultivation and the stewardship. And thinking of the stewardship, are we thanking donors? Are we letting them know their gift you know, will or did make a difference? Are we spending money in the manner that we promised? What a lot of the research indicates is donors want to know what difference their money made, specifically how many people did we feed, how many people did we you know, put in a safe environment, how many people received a scholarship, wh whatever your mission may be. Tell me as the donor what difference it's making. Don't ignore me and expect me to compete again when I don't know what the outcome of my contribution was in the first place. Now, maintaining donor relationships, the thank you letters we send out, the recognition we offer, the invitations to activities and events, um, consistent updates from the organization. I think one of the things that we fail to think about generally is well, they, they get a newsletter so they should know what's going on. I think the organizations that go the step further, a quarterly note from the president, something uh, in addition to that newsletter for donors at a certain level. What are we doing uh, to make a difference and let our donors know that we're making a difference? There's saying they're not getting the phone call, they're surprised to get the phone call. There's a time to interact with them. Um, I always used to say when I made the phone calls as a board member, I'd say, now, I'm sure that all the other charities you support have made this phone call as well. So I was hoping the donor would say, well, they don't call me. And I'd say, well, you're important to us. Um, I don't speak for those other charities, but you make a difference for our organization. What an opportunity to continue to steward that relationship. So all that in mind, what does creating a fundraising program really look like? Um, I, I get, I, you know, I always say we try to layer this or silo this and put this in a way um, so that we can identify it or categorize it in some way. Let's not, let's just start from the get-go and, and just agree a gift gift. I don't care whether it's a major, an annual, a plan, whatever kind of gift it is, it's a contribution. So from the get-go, I don't get hung up in, was that a major gift? Was that a plan? You know. It's a gift. And then we get into, is it restricted? Is it unrestricted? Is it for the endowment? Is it a non-endowment gift? You know, all of this terminology distracts us from what we're trying to do, which is to build a relationship with people and to give them an opportunity to give. I didn't say it's not important, but I would discourage you from starting the conversation at this point. Then we get into a 40-minute conversation at a board meeting defining what a major gift is, which is a distraction from soliciting gifts in the first place. So I, I always start there. I, I get into defining strategies in an appropriate way. And by that, I mean where I think a lot of organizations struggle. It's not that you don't know how to raise money. You do. If, if the poll was, how do you ask people for money, we get some answers I provide. Well, we mail things to people. We ask them. They come to events. Uh, you know, they can give online. We email them. You know, text message. All, all that. We know those things. So how can I tell you how to do something you already do. I think what we struggle with is who's doing it. When, when we look, whose job is it to do what? And I, and I look at this when I think about when you're creating a program, um, you know, what is staff job and what is board job? So the staff are doing, in my opinion, the more lower level things, the mailings, the newsletter, the website, behind the scenes at events. Um, assisting volunteers with solicitations that are done in person, uh, preparing a proposal for a funder. That's not going to work. Well, the board, where does the board fit in? Well, those gift solicitations, um, the major role they play at events and activities, both getting people there and glad handing when they're there, cultivating or stewarding potential donors or current donors. They're the face of the organization. And the other thing that I throw in here is I think we need to spend time talking about what we do that's successful. We go 
we're being spent talking about programs and services and for the gym, uh, all the things we've done that have impacted the success of all of those activities. Because I think that encourages people. It tells people that this can be done and there's an outcome uh, associated with it. The other thing is to make sure that you have the right measures in place. And I mentioned that earlier. Um, they all have a different, um, a different measure in terms of what your expectation ought to be. Um, whether you're doing a mailing, whether you're phoning donors and asking for contributions, conducting events, they all have a different outcome. We know, um, probably without argument, that if I sat down with someone and asked them for money at the right time, I'd get a much, much bigger gift than if I sent them a letter. And, and so while that's most successful, it's not going to reach the most people. So you have to look at this holistically. Where do I deploy my personnel? Board members at the first level staff probably a little bit at the more broad-based levels. It's together that it creates a holistic fundraising environment. Um, they operate in silos. They feed each other. And we need some type. So when a board member says we're trying to run hundred thousand dollars this year, you know, somebody on the board's gonna say, Well, one gift of not grant there. Well, that's true, it will, but also yeah, we're not getting it. Okay. But I need to build that pyramid. I need to make sure I have donors coming in at all sizes and of all types. It's role modeling for others, it gives us an opportunity to upgrade donors. So building that donor pyramid, using all of these different strategies, and knowing who within the organization is deploying them is a real important part, really, of creating that program. Speaking of board members. Hey, Dave. Um, yeah. I've got a question that's come in sure. here. And um, one, of, one of the questions is, is it necessary for a nonprofit organization themselves to really enter all this data? Um, isn't, it being, isn't it extracted by GuideStar is the question, I believe. Oh. There's a difference between entering donor data so that you can store them, you know, create a donor in your database. And they'll You're breaking out a little bit. Okay. Um, GuideStar is a list of um, is a charities have a rating that are really nice. Okay. If I interpreted that question correctly, did I? You think I interpreted that correctly? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think the idea was you're talking about data collection and and you know mining data and understanding donor data. And I think the question right. was, well, isn't that getting extracted by GuideStar? And I think what no. you're talking about is yeah. more granular data. Right. Yeah. My how many donors at two hundred fifty dollars at five hundred at twenty? You know, GuideStar. You know, they'll 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 post your nine ninety, and they may have some broad based numbers, but you know, it's it's certainly not as granular as you you know as you noted, and it's just not that granular. So. Right. Um, so as you're building your program, I think one of the questions we get quite a bit is, well, okay, I'm, I, I'm at the staff. Dave, hello, I'm the staff member, and I get what you're telling me, but my board is struggling. Where do they fit in all this? I mean, I'm, I'm tired of nagging them. I just need to go out and raise the money. Okay, I get it, but where do they fit? Well, you know, I look at things where they can play a role and um, in which I need them to encourage them to get engaged. But one, I think they, they need to help set the goals. Not the overall budget, but I think they need to look at what are the fundraising goals of the organization. And I think the role that we as staff can play is to help them understand what does $100,000 look like? How much did we raise last year? What were the gift you know sizes and ranges and how many in each? And Give me an understanding of what our fundraising program is about. Help, have them help you create the actual plan. I do think the development plan of staff members is likely to write, but I think you want to go to a, a board committee and have them to give you some feedback. Yeah, you know, this is how board members are going to be involved in the event specifically and how we think we should involve them in solicitations, which leads to the help to monitor the plan. Um, the, the staff, and it's tough for you to walk in and say to the board, well, here's where we are with the plan, uh, you know, it's their plan too. So I think reporting on progress and successes, as is noted here, I think is as much a board role as it is a staff role. So you might be offering the information, but I think having a board member 
share what is happening, where we are, who's been doing what, I, I think it speaks louder than the staff members does. And specifically, responsibilities for board members in terms of what specific tasks can they do. We look at things like, um, as the next slide indicates, add personalized notes uh, to direct mail appeals, um, invite you know friends and colleagues, people in their network to events, host an event in your home where there's a small, you know, very uh, um, refined and, and defined list of attendees where you can talk about the organization. Uh, work with the organization staff when they're preparing proposals um, uh, to a foundation or a funder or a corporate entity. Have them look at your corporate giving program. Um, have them provide some input on your case statement. Um, you know, I, my favorite, I'm, I keep putting this on there because if I don't, someone brings it up. But, well, you know, my board gets those items for the silent auction. Okay, well, that's a board member activity. So let's put it on there. Um, you know, have them look to see if their company has a matching gift program. Some of these are broad-based. Some of these are specific to them. But I think you want to have an idea for board members. And if we look, I have more on the next slide. Um, maybe they're making the ask or they're bringing you to make the ask. Um, you know, making a contribution. Have they made a planned gift? So, I mean, you know, it's a matter of where does the board fit in terms of what it is they're willing to do. Now, here's the important side note. Um, I, I have found that, that organizations that are good at raising money, which I don't measure by the amount they raise, I measure what's the level of engagement across the organization. Uh, and then I look at my metrics, how much dollar and, you know, was it stratification at key. Um, but the, board, the organization where board members are involved in a way they are comfortable do that produces greater income. So you may have board members that only want to write thank you letters. Let them do it. You may have board members who only want to make thank you calls. Have them do it. You may have board members who want to ask. By all means, let them go out and ask. You know, so find the strength for each board member to lend some depth to your development team. Because at the end of the day, we are competing in an environment where some organizations have, look at higher ed, hundreds of development professionals whose job it is to go out and raise money. They ask. That's their only job. We don't, most of us have that luxury. And so how do we stay competitive as we involve our volunteers in a meaningful way? The other thing is, and you've all heard the, the elevator speech. Uh, notion. Spend some time at a board meeting, devoted, dedicated time at a board meeting uh, uh, to let board members sort of craft, you know, a quick minute, half a minute, two minute description of the organization's plan. It, you know, it's a two-way conversation. One of the ways I start that conversation is I often ask, listen, if it, what would happen if we, if our organization went away tomorrow? You know, what, what would we do? But what would the impact be? And it's it's always curious when board members can't answer that question. Now, the eloquence with which they answer it's, it's obviously going to vary. But they, for those who can't answer it at all, it's a it's a it's a bizarre um, feeling. I mean, how could they not answer that question? I you know, I give you a great example is uh, uh, I'm I'm on a Habitat for Humanity board and and. And we, we talked about the elevator speech, and, you know, the most common thing that people got wrapped up in was, well, you know, Dave, this is hard. We, people think that we give houses away, and we don't. And I thought, you know, maybe this is the platform to use to sort of change the nature of the conversation. So I, you know, I said, well, maybe that is the point at which we enter the conversation, you know? So when someone says, yeah, don't you guys give away houses, you know, maybe we need to have a systematic response like, we don't give away houses at all. What we do is we gain partner families for generations, which, which is a much different approach, which usually gets the, well, what, what exactly does that mean? Well, there's my opening. Well, our partner families participate in building their home. They participate in a home ownership class. And when it's done, not only do they have a home that they put sweat equity into, 
but they also know what it means to be a homeowner. So really, when we put people in a safe home where their kids school, attend school more regularly and the neighborhood's more safe and the quality of housing is improved, we're seeing graduation rates improve from high school. We're seeing kids go on to college. So the home is just, you know, it's sort of secondary to the whole thing. And so that's a much different thing. Well, don't you guys give away houses? And so work with the board. Get them to get them to wrap their arms around what am I saying in public? I find more and more that board members who don't get engaged just don't know how to talk about the organization. They just don't. Think about it. The people who join our boards are talking to people to begin with, in my opinion. They just have no idea what to say, and they're uncomfortable with it. And so, so thinking about assembling a program where we've divided the responsibilities appropriately and we figured out a way to get the board engaged is, is really crucial to this whole process. See, it's not about going out and asking. It's about preparing ourselves in a meaningful way so we know the components and we know how we're going to go out and solicit people. And we also want to be cultivating and soliciting them. But there are times when I've experienced it's not really about the fundraising at all. So <clears throat> what we see is um, boards saying, well, you know, it's the staff's job to raise money. And, and they're doing an adequate job or they're not doing an adequate job. And I, and I often suggest, well, I understand that the board, or excuse me, the staff plays a role in this, but you want as a board certain kind of results. And, and what I want to share with you is that this organization has gotten as far as it's going to get using the systems and methodologies it has used. So if your approach is it's the staff's job, your staff is competent, but they can only take you so far. So what I ultimately arrive at is that this really isn't a fundraising problem. So if you look at the next slide, you know, yes, staff is qualified and we're doing our jobs, but we can't. You know, this, this isn't a fundraising problem. We know how to do the fundraising part. And so there might be a broader, um, there might be a broader issue at hand. Um, and so I look at it and I say, well, if we look at the next slide, does the board not plan, own, or implement the plan in any way? If we've done all the planning and all the prep work and we're reporting to them, we, we kind of own part of that problem. You know, well, what do we expect them to do but to comment on what we've told them we are going to do? So involving them I think is important. It is not simply something nice to do. Um, you know, it's no wonder that they don't think it's their job. And when you look at that, it, whether we've created that intentionally or not, we have a uh, problem at that point. Now, you're going to say, well, I know I have a board problem and I'm not raising money. Well. Again, I look at this, as we look at the next slide, how did board members come to us to begin with? Did we strategically decide who serves, or did we informally decide who serves? Have we strategically gone out and found people who understand fundraising, what it means and how to do it, or did we stumble upon people and bring them onto the board? And in either case, was the expectation of what they should do agreed to in advance? So did they know what they were getting into? The number of organizations that that decide on a Monday, there's an election on Thursday, and call people and ask them to serve, generally end up with a pretty stinky board. Right? They they find themselves having to mislead people about what the job is in order to get them to accept it. So, Dave, you don't have to raise money or go to meetings. I mean, I don't have time to tell you what the real job is because I only have a few days versus some sort of strategic approach uh, that that shows how to, you know, gives us time to cultivate a potential board memory and show them the job and show them the expectation hey, in advance. Yep. We, we got a question here on this expectations component, and, it, and that mm -hmm. is, you know, what about when the expectations were laid out up front, but then they were not followed up uh, upon by the board member? Okay. And so um, at the end of the day, when you're in a situation like that, the next part of this process you have to think about is the evaluation component. So I would ask, is there a way in which your board members um, are evaluated? So do they fill out a self-evaluation that's then collected and reviewed by a committee of the board so that their performance can be judged? And 
most organizations have, I shouldn't say most, very few actually have a good evaluation in that sense. The other element is there are some things that are not objective. So I would have a scorecard. Did was was you know their annual gift made as required? Did they attend meetings as required? Did they attend, right? In addition to some of the self evaluation component, um, so you have a snapshot. You know, is Dave, is Dave stepping up or not? And this works only, and I underscore only, if this committee of the board, which we often call a governance committee, will act on the results of that and either approach people and talk to them about their evaluation or just simply not renew them if we have term limits or actually approach them and say, quite frankly, maybe this isn't the job for you. Okay, if, if, if this isn't the job, there are other ways you can serve this organization in a volunteer capacity. Maybe this isn't the job. So when I talk about expectation agreed to in advance, I also think you need a strong evaluation process, which I have here. Is there an evaluation process? Um, if if it's the staff that's doing all of this, it's it's a it's an ugly and tough road, and it's fraught with peril. This the board has to lead this kind of approach without without a doubt, um, because as you see in the next slide, who's at the table in our board? It, it matters who's on our board. Um, it, it's it's uh, it's not uncommon for you know for me to hear. Um, well, listen, we have Frank because he's a lawyer, and we have Mary because she's a CPA. Um, and the challenge we get there is that uh, we're, we're pigeoning people. We're pigeonholing them. I've, met, I've, I've talked to, in my 20-plus years, CPAs and say, I didn't want to be the treasurer, but, you know. And so um, if you need legal counsel, go out and get it. If, if you need someone, um, you mean you're having an audited financial statement, I, I don't know what you need a CPA for that, you know, but find skills that meet the needs of the organization. Now, if you think needing a lawyer and, and, and a CPA meet the needs, fine, but they're still subject to all the other rules. They still need to go out and, and, and adhere to the board expectation statement. I prefer finding people who meet what we need. If there happen to be a CPA or a lawyer, fine. But there's a lot of small business owners who are just as smart as CPAs and lawyers because they're small business owners and who probably are more creative. So I mean, think about that. The other thing is, you know, if you have an environment that prioritizes, excuse me, prioritizes fundraising, are we even talking about it at meetings? Do we have any retreat opportunity where we learn how to do it and train ourselves and talk about it? Um, you know, are we reporting on the successes? Are we building a culture where fundraising can happen? And and that's, you know, that's as much a board responsibility as it is, in, in all likelihood, our executive director, our CEO, the the, the chief paid staff person. And a couple of examples um, uh, th that I've had over the years are, one is, you know, I went back to this accountability piece, this evaluation is, you know, with organizations who actually have a spreadsheet and in there, you know, things that, um, that they use to determine did Dave do his job. Um, along with some of the more, you know, flexible gray areas, you know, about the skills he brings and what are some of the other things he's done that, you know, might outweigh some of the things he didn't do. But there's a specific process by which they really are measuring people. And I think it's fair. I mean, we don't pay board members, but we're trying to change our little piece to the world. And while board members are not paid, that doesn't mean we should accept non-performance. And I think that's important. Um, the other issue um, uh, was a governance committee structure issue where if you if you if you take on ownership of you know we don't know what we don't know what we do know is the group we have now it's going to be hard to build that fundraising culture have frankly just gone out and built governance committees and so the governance committee would handle things like the expectation statement the evaluation uh, at board education pieces and the election and so they create a structure that makes sure that we're always getting the most ideal board people all the time. And so um, those are the not, it's not about fundraising pieces. Those are about what are the things that prevent us most commonly for our sector in being successful with nonprofit organizations when it comes time to raising money. I mean, we all have great programs. 
we just like to do more of them. And it's hard to do more of them with less money. And when you look at it, to be fair, it isn't that it's less money. It's that we need to have a program that identifies who's doing what and has some accountability measures when it comes to how we best involve volunteers. They should be held accountable. They should expect to be held accountable, but they should have as much interest and love and desire in moving the mission forward as anyone who's paid on our staffs does at the end of the day. And if they don't, again, maybe they're in the wrong role. I, I did outline here some resources, um, and I want to bring them to your attention for a couple of reasons. One is uh, the board building cycle is um, an exceptional publication from Board Source that um, talks about creating systems where you can have accountability and shared. I mean, it has great stuff. If you're familiar with Board Source resources, they're handbooks. They're not hardcover academic pursuits. And it has all the samples you can, you could ever want or need in terms of how do I, how does our organization build a structure where we can get the best performance out of board members. The other book, yes, it's my book, Fearless Fundraising for Nonprofit Boards. I, I've already been paid, so you buy no copies or a million, I don't get any more money, so I just want to tell you that. But what I do is, um, in a very quick read, is I try to help board members understand more broadly what does it mean to fundraise. Out of the gate, they're going to say, I don't want to ask people for money. And the truth is, there's so much more to it than that. So there's some things in there that, that can help move, inch a board forward in that regard. And then finally, I think um, I, I think a must read for every board member is the 10 basic roles and responsibilities uh, of nonprofit boards. What, am, what is this board doing in the first place? And sometimes I've backed the conversation up to that point. You know, what our overall roles are. Everything else becomes some of the role. Um, how do we have an impact and, and raise more money? So, broad terms, um, specific questions or thoughts or concerns as, um, at this point? I think most of the questions that we've had come through today, we've tried to push through. Um, I guess if anybody has questions, please go ahead and put them out in the Q&A now or also in the chat window, whichever is easier for you. Feel free. Um, we'll try and get those answered here. Um, but while we're waiting to see if those come through, these resources, Dave, they're all available on BoardSource's website, correct? Dave? Are we on you? Well, we may have lost our speaker. Okay, well, please join me in thanking Dave for today's content and BMO Harris especially for their support. Uh, the presentation he shared was so valuable, as with, and as with all of our webinars, the recording will be made available uh, for playback from our website, and we will also link to uh, Dave's PowerPoint as well. Um, I would encourage all participants to review our website at forwardci.org. For more information on how forward community investments might help your organization. One last note, when you close your browser from today's session, you will be directed to a very concise questionnaire to evaluate today's webinar. Please take a few minutes to complete to help us continue to improve the effectiveness of these offerings. Our next session, uh, or our next edition in the virtual leadership series will take place on Tuesday, November 19th and will be presented by Jane Arsenault and will cover collaboration. If you would like to participate, we will send the registration link in the follow-up email to this webinar. Once again, we'd like to thank BMO Harris Bank for making this exceptional learning opportunity available, and take care and enjoy the remainder of your day.